Okay. Um, this has really been a wonderful conference with many, many great talks, both in these plenary sessions and in the parallel sessions. Um, I will thank the organizers towards the end, but let me start by not thanking them for asking me to give this visions talk. Luckily, they didn't ask me to summarize this conference because it's clearly, or at least for me, unsummarizable. Uh, it's <clears throat> so I'm glad I don't have to attempt to do that. Um, really has been an amazing time here in China, in Beijing, in Tsinghua, which is a beautiful campus. Um, and I will try to entertain you at the end of this long week with so much information that I'm sure you're all, as I am, mentally exhausted. And uh, so I hope my talk will be slightly entertainment, will contain a little bit of history, there's and a little bit of and a little vision, little bit of vision, hopefully. But first I'd like to say a bit about China. You know, I noticed in the news a few days ago, actually here, a, uh, a, an incredible development in China, which as a, uh, an American I'm very jealous of. And, oops, this, oh, I know it. I forgot to connect it. That's here. Okay, that should work. So the news was was this picture on the internet, which only took me ten or fifteen minutes to download. So what is this strange contraption? China has built the much anticipated straddling bus. This is not this, this is actually a model that was shown off in May, but they've actually built the real thing. What it is, is a, this is a bus which travels along in a, uh, along a, path like this, and it's powered by electricity, no pollution. It transports 1,400 people in this bus, 40 miles an hour down urban streets, and cars can pass right through it. So it's no barrier to traffic, no pollution, mass transportation. You know, I encounter LA traffic all the time, or New York traffic. This was invented in the United States in the 60s. It was planned for New York. They have built it. And it was taken for its first test drive on Tuesday in the northeastern city of Trin, Trin Hongdao. Now, I noticed this, it's amazing, but I was especially drawn to the fact that Ching Hongdao, correct, is the site of the Great Collider. <laughs> now the Great Collider we heard a bit about uh, in the first day from Yifang. And uh, it is a marvelous project that is being proposed here in China with in collaboration um, with the international community in high energy physics. I am convinced that it would be a great boom for China and for international collaboration and for physics and for science in general. And uh, <clears throat> this might not be the site, but this is one of the proposed sites. 
I hope you all agree with me. I was going to do a little experiment. If you believe that the collider is a great idea, can we clap for the collider? Okay, that's pretty good. Oops. So, Strings 2016. So, this was a wonderful conference, as strings tend to be. Um, <clears throat> but what, one of the things characteristic about this conference was the incredible variety and breadth of topics discussed, which is either a sign of great health and vitality or a sign of lack of focus. I think it's the former. Now, I, as I said, the conference as a whole is not summarizable, certainly by me. But there are two particular developments were, which were discussed at length by, many, by a variety of speakers, which I personally thought were particularly exciting and new. And one, of course, was the increasing understanding of the emergence of space-time and the relationship between quantum states, and in particular, the entanglement of quantum states and space-time geometry. And the other was somewhat newer, in a sense, the uh, SYK model, perhaps, of soluble holographic string theory. And many other areas in which uh, string theory is exploring. Uh, I think I've covered a good portion of them, but there actually are others as well. Now, I don't have either the time or the preparation or probably the ability to comment on each of the developments. Um, and I plan to revisit the website when I get back to Santa Barbara, uh, because I've learned, and I'm sure we all have, a lot this last week. But in these particular topics, uh, are partic I find particularly exciting. Emergent space-time has always been a dream and a goal of many of us in string theory, and it's now been realized for some years how uh, powerful is the use of entanglement um, to relate the quantum states of a dual description of string theory to the structure of space-time itself. Juan Montesina gave a beautiful review of this subject, and there were many other very wonderful contributions uh, to this connection between the structure of quantum states on the boundary of ADS and uh, the geometry of the bulk. In, I think we understand now in, in greater and greater um, detail how the nature, we're beginning to, how the structure of semi-classical space-time in the bulk is determined by the nature of quantum states on the boundary. One of the main tools uh, being the um, Ru Taganaki conjecture formula relationship between um, entanglement on the boundary and the geometrical properties of a minimal surface uh, in the bulk. What, what, one of the contributions, and I'm not really going to refer to any particular contributions in this talk, but the one, one of them that I found most interesting uh, was that of Matthew Hedrick, who um, 
replace this way of thinking about the, <coughs> the uh, or, or of calculating the um, entropy of a subsystem on the boundary in terms of, in terms not of the area uh, of a minimal surface whose boundary is that region uh, in the bulk, but rather the minimal density of threads passing um, from a region A to its complement. And, and to some extent, that addressed the question that Juan ended his beautiful review with, where are the bits in the bulk? So if the ADSC FT duality uh, is a relationship between the quantum structure of states on the boundary and the bulk, where do the qubits that one can see on the boundary uh, exist in the bulk? Um, Matt seems to have replaced that by the question, what are the threads? And uh, these flow lines, the threads, beg the question, what is flowing? But replacing one question for which we don't know the answer with another, um, although it might not answer the question, uh, I have no doubt is going to shed new light on emergent space-time. The other thing which is very new and exciting, I, in my opinion, is the uh, Sachdev Yekataev model. Um, a model that was developed many years ago in condensed matter physics in order to find a quantum critical point, a conformal field theory, and a simple quantum mechanical soluble example by uh, Subir Sachdev and Ye, and used by Kataev to perhaps construct a simple holographic dual of a black hole or of quantum gravity. Now, Kataev is somewhat like Perlman. You know, he doesn't publish. So he does very interesting physics, but it's very rare that you find it in print. If you want to learn a, about the origin of this model and uh, there's a set of beautiful lectures on the KATP website that were given um, a while ago. And uh, <coughs> many people, uh, Mary and Polchinski and Rosenhaus, and especially Stanford and Maldesina and Verlinde and many others have been um, explaining and filling in the gaps and going beyond what Kataev uh, announced in this talk, somewhat like the way the response to Perlman's uh, proof of the Poincaré conjecture. But, so this is a fascinating model. It is perhaps the first of a new class of large N theories. And for some of us, large N has been an, a, a lifelong obsession. Um, ve um, vector large N theories are simple and have given us enormous insight into many body theory and quantum field theory, as have matrix large N theories. And this kind of large N theory is somewhere in between, soluble but richer than vector models. And it might be, for all I know, uh, just the tip of the iceberg on a whole class of large N soluble theories. Uh, it is the, an, an amazing example of a one-dimensional system, or just quantum mechanics with no space, um, with a diffeomorphism invariant conformal symmetry, infinite dimensional conformal symmetry in the infrared. Uh, that's, of course, broken, but um, that's quite an amazingly simple infinite dimensional gate symmetry. And most excitingly, it might be a soluble holographic 
that V should be a C, string in the bulk. And uh, soluble models, even in one plus one dimension, or maybe there are more dimensions, um, have always proved in, in our field to be of a, enormous value. So uh, this model and its elaborations and variations might, might give us much insight in the future. Now, there was the, the conference started out with a wonderful talk by John Swartz on the history of string theory. And uh, at least the history in the 20th century. And then there were some 21st century attempts by Nima and by Zohar to uh, redo history. So I would like to make some historical remarks. And I planned them actually in, in order to say a word or two about one of uh, the great physicists of the, of the uh, last century. Uh, who contributed much to string theory, Stanley Mandelstam, who died a few weeks ago. Now, Stanley um, was, in my opinion, the godfather, and I don't mean the mafia godfather, I mean, you know, he was, gave birth, in some sense, to string theory, which I'll explain, because, because <coughs> uh, I was around. <laughs> And aside from John, I think that's um, we're unique in that capacity here. So the intellectual history of string theory, I actually does go back 50 years, just about. It is half a century, and it goes back to the early 60s, to the middle 60s, 19, the period of 1965-67, when the rage was uh, current algebra sum rules, you know, trying to test the broken chiral SU3 cos SU3 flavor symmetry, as we would say nowadays, of the strong interactions by writing down sum rules. And um, so he had these sum rules, and a variety of people figured out how you might test them, calculate both sides of the sum rule. And typically, the only theoretical method that poor theory had back then was to sum over poles. That was about it. You know, if you tried to have a theory of the S matrix of a scattering amplitude, you just figured out what poles exist in, in uh, say, the direct channel, and you summed over them the limit, how far we've come in half a century. Okay, you summed over poles. In terms of stringy diagrams, we would say nowadays you summed over poles in this channel. Two particles come in, resonance. You put into your sum rules that enabled you to check these, uh, these sum rules that follow from current algebra, a sum of poles, and you tested the sum rules. But there was another development in the early 60s, which had to do not with direct production of resonances, but rather exchange of Reggie trajectories, um, especially as it was th these straight line Reggie trajectories uh, that described the analytic continuation and angular momentum of the partial waves in cross channels, in the T channel, um, were discovered to lie on these linear trajectories. And uh, another approach to discussing amplitudes, especially at large energy, was to sum over the exchange of Reggie poles or Reggie trajectories. Now, at some point, Dolan, Horn, Schmidt, and E.G. noted a what we now call a duality. And as far as I know, this was the first time duality appeared, the word and the notion in um, 
high energy physics. <laughs> they said instead of summing both over resonances and exchange of Reggie trajectories, which would have which was natural to do, that was double counting. And their duality was a kind of vague statement that one should represent scattering amplitudes as either sums over resonances in one channel or trajectories in the other channel. Pretty weird thing. Of course, not the string theorists, where we, these are simply different ways of cutting, of piecing together the same stringy diagram. But there was no string theory back then. However, this had some testable predictions. You could test it. You could take a scattering amplitude that you measure, try to estimate it using a sum of poles in the S channel or a sum of trajectories in the T channel, the dual descriptions, we would say. And uh, there was a claim that it worked. with some accuracy. Not very rigorous, not very precise at all, but it's a very interesting idea. What did it mean? Now, I remember clearly 50 years ago, just about today, when I attended the, my first conference ever. Yes, um, I just had graduated from uh, just got my PhD from Berkeley, and the ICHEP, the high energy, it used to be called the Rochester Conference, was held in Berkeley that year, and uh, I was just a, you know, essentially a graduate student, so I went, like some of you, to learn about what was going on, and I heard a wonderful talk by Sergio Fubini, who said, in, with respect to this idea, what we need is not a pole, you know, a resonance in the scattering amplitude. What we need is a Mandelstam pole. That term never survived. What he meant by that was we need some way of representing a scattering amplitude that contained both poles in the S channel, this channel, and poles in the T channel. Now, Fubini had a wonderful imagination. He was very inspired, and he just said that in his summary talk at that meeting. And uh, that inspired a bunch of people, including me. And, but it was, how, what did it mean, and how would you construct a, Paul, a Mandelstam pole? Well, Mandelstam proposed how to do this. That's why I regard him as the godfather of string theory, in 1967. The paper was published in the beginning of 68, but uh, it was a preprint in the summer of 67, about a year after, a year later. He wrote a specific proposal for a, di a dynamics based on rising Reggie trajectories, linear trajectories. So he made an approximation, as did Zohar today, that the scattering amplitude can be approximated by the contribution of a finite number of Reggie poles. Actually, you need an infinite number, of course. Uh, he assumed that the Reggie trajectories are straight lines, or equivalently, the scattering amplitude is dominated by narrow or stable particles, sharp resonances. Uh, Forget about the unitarity. Crossing is introduced by means of the generalized superconvergence relations due to E.G. and Horn and Schmidt, which sounds totally meaningless, but it is just the crossing symmetry, the duality I talked about. Then Levinson's theorem, et cetera, et cetera. A very specific, this is just the abstract, very specific 10-page outline of how to go about constructing a Mandelstam pole. Um, you know, essentially the assumptions that Zohar 
described today in much more uh, rigorous fashion. <clears throat> um, well, I liked that idea, and I tried to construct it. So I, um, at the end of that year, bootstrap of the row edge trajectory within the dynamical scheme proposed by Mandelstam, rising edge trajectories now resonanced, generalized superconvergence relation is crossing symmetry. And try to do it for this channel, which has the advantage that it, the exchange particle is rho in, in all cyclic channels. Anyway, and even try to do it for the vacuum, which would be the graviton graviton amplitude in today's terms, it didn't work. Anyway, I didn't solve the problem, but I, gamma functions began to occur. At the same time, there was another group in Israel, Adamello Rubinstein, Hector Rubinstein, Veneziano Virosoro, young postdocs at the Weizmann Institute, who essentially did the same thing with similar results. So this was a few people who were following Mandelstam's suggestion about how to construct a Mandelstam pole. But of course, what happened was that a few months later, Gabriele Veneziano, on a boat back home from the Weizmann Institute to Italy, discovered the beta function. And the rest is history. That's how string theory began. So Mandelstam deserves an enormous credit, in my opinion, for uh, being the godfather of string theory. OK. Now, of course, what we were trying to do back then was understand experimental high energy physics, especially the strong interactions. Today, and theory was pretty impotent. You know, we saturated things with poles, Reggie poles or poles, with no real dynamics. The situation today is very different. The bottleneck in particle physics is experimental, not theoretical. We have tons of speculation, wonderful ideas, uh, not much experimental uh, evidence or clues. And we're all waiting to know whether, for example, the 750 GV bump or fluctuation is real. Now, I've heard definitive opinions on this from many members of the audience who know for a fact, based on the publication of results in Facebook, <laughs> that there is no particle there. But I would like to hear the experimenters say that. Or whatever else they're going to say in a few hours, in the next few days. But, you know, we do have a problem. The problem is that the Planck scale, which Planck identified and the standard model confirms appears to be the relevant scale where uh, unification takes place, where strings are evident, et cetera, et cetera. And for theory, that's not really much of a problem by and large, we can hope, because Physics varies logarithmically from here, or from the LHC, to the Planck scale. Unless there are new thresholds, which we hope there might be, there should be. But by and large, variation of physics, physical phenomena, is logarithmic. Which means that we can extrapolate over many orders of magnitude easily, because the logarithm is small. But the cost of exploring scales, higher energy scales, increases like a power, like the second power or worse in energy. And the disparity between this behavior of physics and this behavior of technology or of um, building instruments is a real problem. And we've been facing now for many years. That's one reason it's so important to do what we can to 
even um, go to a scale which is an order of magnitude greater than the LHC, like the Great Collider. But it's a fact of nature. We can't do anything about facts of nature. We have to figure out what, how to deal with them. So let's go to string theory where theorists are unencumbered, can extrapolate, have no uh, fewer constraints, at least until nature speaks her mind. So what is the state of string theory? What is string theory? Well, if you judge what string theory is by the content of strings 2016, you might say string theory is mostly quantum field theory, which of course overlaps with particle physics and condensed matter physics and quantum information now and relativity and cosmology and as always math. And Nadi talked eloquently about the unity of physics and math and everything that we call, well that's what we listened to this week, what we call string theory. So we can simply put everything in the bag, as Nadi did, and call this string theory. Um, so I asked myself, is this a good term? Um, you know, if we consider strings 2xxx, where x might be any integer from 0 to 9, uh, what are the x's, what, are, what is this going to be replaced when the x's become bigger than 0? Um, should we perhaps call this physics 2xxx? <laughs> Contain, but, you know, even that's not enough. Well, that's misleading because most of physics is experimental physics. So maybe we should just call it fundamental physics. That's dangerous. It's politically loaded. Besides which, it doesn't contain mathematics and all computer science. Maybe all things fundamental. <laughs> Well, that's a bit awkward. So I actually haven't been able to come up with a better name. So we might as well stick to strings. But we have to really understand what strings is. Now I've made the point, and I'm sure some of you have heard me, but I'm going to reiterate that string theory, we don't know what it is, but even worse than that, it's not a theory. And I like to distinguish between a framework, a theory, and a model. <laughs> framework is something like classical mechanics, or quantum mechanics, or quantum field theory, which is not a theory but a framework, and string theory, which is not a theory but a framework. A theory is something like Newton's or Einstein's theory of gravity, Maxwell's theory of DNM, or the standard model, which isn't a model, it's a theory. <laughs> a theory is something specific, they might have some undetermined parameters or structure that you only know is true because that's the way nature works. But you can put its principles or its equations on a t-shirt and given a few numbers you can calculate, make predictions, disprove the theory, the Popperian sense. A model uh, is not like the standard model, that's really a theory. A model is something like the BCS theory, should be a model, <laughs> of superconductivity. In other words, it, you take a system of electrons or of atoms and you make various approximations consistent with quantum mechanics and our knowledge of nuclei and atoms and, and uh, you, you, you have an, keep the essence enough so that you can understand superconductivity. And if the model is bad, you made some errors, you don't change the theory, the standard model or non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you just, you know, you correct your approximations. Beyond the standard model, models are models of uh, quantum field theories that go beyond the, contain and go beyond the standard model. But string theory, I believe, belongs here as does quantum field theory, their frameworks. 
So more specifically, the general framework we have for physics nowadays is quantum mechanics, or specifically relativistic quantum mechanics, or quantum field theory. And within those frameworks, we have discovered, not derived, but you know, taken from experiment, um, the quantum, particular quantum field theory within this framework that describes nature, as far as we can tell. And we call it the standard model, but it really is a theory. And within the standard model, there's my favorite theory, QCD, which has very few parameters, if any. And once you have a theory, then you can calculate. You can test with experiment, or you can calculate the spectrum of hadrons. So that's what you can do when you have a theory. You can disprove it uh, in the Popperian sense, and that often happens, or you can calculate things you weren't able to calculate before. Now, in string theory, we don't have a theory, we have a framework. Not only that, this framework is not, in my opinion, separate or different than the framework of that contains consistent quantum field theories. In fact, the stringy field theory framework contains just about all consistent field theories and stringy, brainy methods of calculating consistent semi-classical approximations to states in Hilbert space. And it appears, including quantum gravity. It's an incredible framework. And we don't even understand the boundaries of this framework. We don't understand the boundaries of quantum field theory, to be honest. We understand low energy quantum field theories, and we understand conformal fixed points. But once you start going to the UV, you need a bigger framework, and we have no idea what its extent is, what its structure is. That's what, by and large, people working in string theory are doing, is trying to understand this framework and control it. So, again, we have the framework of theoretical physics we've learned, especially since ADS-EFT, contains the quantum field theory framework and string theory and has informed us that they're the same framework. But the question we face is, how do we get from this, the original goal of many of us who went from particle physics to string theory, the standard theory, the standard so-called model, and be in a position to calculate some of its properties that we can't so far, or explain some of its properties, and predict new phenomena. How do the forces unify? We have these hints that they unify the Planck scale together with gravity. That led us to string theory as a potential now to be understood enlargement of the framework. But we, ha I must say, are far from answering this question of unification. Now, I believe that there are three main issues, conceptual issues, problems, obstacles to solving uh, this problem. Um, and the first is the issue of uniqueness. Because what does it mean to unify the forces? It surely should be better than just find another gut quantum field theory or something like that that replaces the um, ugly SU, well, the SU U1 times SU2 times SU3 standard theory. Um, and string, 30 years ago, string theory methods seem to offer that tantalizing hope of uniqueness. But that hope was soon dashed. 
and uniqueness of a particular theory out of a large framework is not something that physics historically has been particularly able to do. Take the standard model. And uh, why is it so difficult? Now it's regarded as infinitely worse, but I think it's always been the case. Now it's regarded that one string theory or the stri within the string framework, there are many theories or many ways of constructing consistent quantum states in a systematic semi-classical approximation. That's called, they're called vacua. But um, there are in fact an infinite number of such things. But there were an infinite number of such things in the quantum field theory framework as well. I wonder whether this question isn't related to another question that is truly new and incredibly difficult and for physics, fundamentals, well, th this question, what picks the theory from the framework, is not related to the question, again, that physics has avoided for from the, forever, namely the beginning and ending and end of time. Uh, what happens at the Big Bang or at the big something at the end? And the question of how the universe began or what the initial condition of cosmology is, is a question physics, again, has avoided forever, hasn't had to address, doesn't want to address, assumes it's not important for predicting the results of experiments we set up yesterday and measure tomorrow. Um, but when we're asking about the uniqueness of the particular theory in a big framework, it's not obvious that this isn't relevant, especially as Einstein taught us, the answer to any question that involves dynamical space-time, the answer is a history of space-time which contains a beginning, a boundary, if there is one, and an end. And uh, it's not clear that any so-called vacuum or solution or method for constructing consistent quantum states uh, makes any sense at all if it has singular beginnings or weird ends. And here uh, we certainly don't know what the rules are since physics has always avoided this issue. And finally, um, we've learned, and including the dynamics of space-time and quantum gravity, that our very notions of the most fundamental concept we possess, that of space and time, are shaky, and that is clearly connected to our understanding, perhaps, of the answer to this question and this one. Space-time appears to be best thought of as an emergent concept, as well as gravity, in a sense. And um, again, we have no understanding of what it would truly mean to formulate a priori the rules of what physics is and how you do physics without an a priori space-time, or at least time. <coughs> so, we have fantastic instruments and experiments and future experiments. We have fantastic speculations. And I truly believe the best is yet to come. I only hope it comes quick. <laughs> but meanwhile, next year, as we say in Tel Aviv, uh, this is the poster of the uh, strings 2017, which will be held in Tel Aviv at the end of June, as Zohar announced. Um, and I hope to see you all there. Strings 2018, as, as Hiroshi announced, will be in Okinawa. 
in Japan, and Strings 2019 is planned to be in Brussels. Uh, and we will see afterwards. So, thanks. Thanks to uh, our hosts, Esti Yao, who isn't here, but I'll thank him personally. And Chi Kun Tzu, which I'm mispronouncing, I'm sure, who was our vice president of Tsinghua University and has been so welcoming. And to Hong Jiang He. Eh? Uh, and, of course, to the uh, organizers, the lo the, and especially to Li Xi si and to Song Wei, who have done an incredible job and have worked so hard to make this a wonderful conference, and to the administrative staff and the small army of students who have seen after our needs and taken care of us. Thanks to everyone and to all of you. Would be appreciated. Martin's hand is up. We can't hear you. You can't, you can't hear a thing. This was a beautiful talk, of course. But there's something that's kind of problematic. You made this distinction between framework theory and model, which is nice. <laughs> no. Now, what I mean, i give you an example, okay? Let's take Einstein's theory of gravity, okay? It is a classical field theory, right? That's a framework. Local fields, partial PDEs, second order time derivatives, okay? All those things, Einstein, was working in that framework. Now, he added a principle, which is what we usually do, a principle or a, you know, a um, symmetry. His principle was a symmetry principle. And then, uniquely, we would say today, up to a higher, you know, effective field theory, he understood that. He never believed it was the final story. He knew it was just the lowest order term with the cosmological constant of an effective filter. He had a principle, actually, that didn't allow higher derivative terms. But with that principle, he picked out of that general framework of field, classical field theory, which is, by and large, untestable, unless you have a particular theory. He picked out of that framework a particular classical field theory which was generally covert. Okay? Now, I, to some extent, the belief, the hope, original, 30 years ago was that string theory was constrained enough, was a theory, was constrained enough that perhaps with some little bit of extra principle or none, it was unique. That, as I said, was rapidly shattered. <coughs> and to think of something, you know, uh, you might then ask, well, where does Einstein's principle come from? That of general covariance? Einstein would have answered you, uh, you've got to assume something, right? But he was very proud of the fact that his, given the the framework and the added symmetry, 
and ignoring the lambda term. He had essentially no parameters, as long as you don't put in matter, which he tried to then derive. No parameters, just a scale. Um, that's what I mean, okay? The standard model is not of that type. We have no principle that picks out the gauge group. Just the fact that we need that particular gauge group to agree with what we observe. We have no principle to pick out the matter content. Well, you know, anomaly cancellation, but given no principle that picks out how many families there are or what the representation is, as you know, just observation. We have no principle that picks out the masses of the, um, or the Higgs couplings, or the masses of the quarks and leptons. We just have to measure them. People have tried, as you know very well, over the years to find principles, or symmetries, or something, lack of anomalies, or something that would constrain, maybe to as much as possible, and haven't. And that probably, we, I think you probably agree that within the standard quantum field theory framework, it's, we're not likely to find such a principle. Maybe you disagree, but that's the kind of thing you would look for to pick out a theory you can measure, test, calculate uh, from a framework which is very hard to test. You know, that it's very hard to test quantum field theory. Dispersion relation, very hard to find general tests. CPT is the best example, but they're very, to really make progress, you need a theory. Uh, any more comments? Or? Okay. David, uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, I have a question with regard to one of your slides, whereby you pointed out that um, a correlation between energy scale and the well, amount of effort to obtain results, either in theory or in experiment. Um, Experimental case, there, there could be some empirical evidence to suggest that the scale like energy squared. I'm curious how you would draw the conclusion that on the theoretical side, you can extrapolate uh, that you know, the, uh, the scale is like all energy. Thank you. Well, I'm just using our best tool, the standard model. Um, so, for example, where is it? For example, um, you know, here's an extrapolation that was done almost 30, it was done 30 years ago. And uh, this is the limit of observation, LHC. And we extrapolate the forces. Now, you can't extrapolate what you haven't seen. <laughs> so there could be, there, and we hope there. Supersymmetry is a threshold which we can't extrapolate, obviously. Something that is zero and then turns on. But what we really know about is these forces, described by the standard theory and the Higgs sector as well. And, you know, we're theorists. We can extrapolate. Now, nobody would believe us if it didn't, if it wasn't a logarithmic variation over 14, 15 orders of magnitude, but it is. And uh, so nothing much happens until you get to this point here, right, where, where, um, what's happening? Why don't I, hmm, where, where gravity comes in. That's also an extrapolation, by the way. Gravity um, does not vary logarithmically. It varies like a power. 
the charge of gravity is energy itself. So gravity varies like energy squared, just like the cost of accelerators. But it starts out so weak that it's irrelevant until you get to the scale. So my, this, for me, by the way, is the most important clue we have. But, uh, but, it's, but for progress, it's, it's a nightmare. So actually, here we have plotted physics of the standard model, varying very slowly. And this is the cost of accelerators. <laughs> and this is an increase from here to here, the force of gravity, by 40 orders of magnitude. So that's a challenge. If you take one more Right. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 thanks, for, Eva, for reminding me, because I was going to make a comment. Um, yes. Unfortunately, well, OK. That's true, and we hope for the best. OK, well, let's thank David again. <laughs> I think let's thank the audience one more time for a great